Well, like all, well, like many communicative tools, uh, the mixtape or the PA tape develops a community around it. It creates a new public sphere. Uh, and certainly that was the case with the mixtape and with the Go Go PA tape. Uh, in each case, you could argue, I think it's been demonstrated even, that uh, gentrification obviously displaces communities, forces the development of new communities around which um, uh, new public spheres have to be developed. Uh, so to the extent that PA tapes and mixtapes don't have sites of distribution uh, in the same way that they used to, whether it's the small mom and pop uh, record stores or uh, whether it's a barber shop or just a stand on the corner, uh, um, PA tapes, go go tapes are forcibly uh, removed as from that role that they had traditionally played. Uh, they are dispersed in the same way the communities are dispersed. Uh, so when doing, you know, when we interviewed Greg McNeils, who was one of the more popular sound men in the go go community, he was making the point that uh, there are fewer bands being created because fewer people are going to shows, fewer people get, are seeing and, and having PA tapes as part of their normal media diet. Uh, bands are being told that they can't play uh, either with the Congo at all, they can't bring the Congo drum at all, or if they do, he, he said to us that they were literally being told you can't get into the pocket, that if they hear the pocket, a show, the show would be stopped. And then he's recounted an example, I think at DC9 or some other club in the city uh, where they went into the pocket almost accidentally or naturally and the manager of the club shut it down. So uh, uh, I think it's pretty clear that as gentrification occurs, which is, has a major impact, DC is down to last I checked about 52% black, um, what's going to go with it are the, the sites of distribution for PA tapes, uh, for go-go shows and so on. So uh, as go-go is associated with all the negative ills, you know, social ills, um, uh, it's going to be harder to find venues, therefore harder to make PA tapes, which are live recordings of the shows, and therefore have, you're going to have less of a distribution uh, network and less in terms of the number of uh, PA tapes to be distributed, uh, and therefore you know keeping the, the, the culture and the, uh, uh, the community of GoGo -Go, uh, alive. So do you think tapes will become more important if people are spread out and can't find their way to the shows? There'll be even more more wanting to hear the, the sound that they're used to hearing since they can't find it as easily now? I mean, on the one hand, I would think so. Uh, uh, but on the other hand, I mean, I'm just thinking in terms of what, what Greg was telling us, that if, if there are fewer bands being created, fewer shows for bands to play in, fewer venues to distribute the, the PA tapes, um, then it might, uh, in his words, it's going to kill, it's going to be the death of Gogo -Go, uh, as a cultural expression entirely, which was a frightening thing for me to hear. Um, but uh, I think it is, you know, if we look at the, the I think if we broaden this to a sort of, a, of an international historical look at the conditions of colonized people around the world, we could find other examples where dispersal, uh, uh, what we're calling gentrification or colonial removal, uh, does negatively impact the culture in general and could make it disappear. So on the one hand, yeah, I would think that tapes would become more important, but at the other, on the, other, the flip side of that is, where are they going to get them? Uh, and where's the interest going to be renewed and is, you know, uh, regenerated uh, in the community? Uh, so I don't really know exactly, but it does seem like that there are some things that, that go-go lovers in particular should be concerned about. And I think just in general, uh, there should be a concern regarding what's happening uh, to the cultural expression of a colonized people as I see black America, but uh, certainly um, uh, You know any sort of oppressed community uh, I think there should be a general concern whether or not you love go-go in the way that I or others do I think we should all be concerned just on that level um, There's another piece to that that I think that we don't really I don't know if that we have enough time to get into properly, but as, and I don't know, and I haven't studied this, but to the extent that things move online, people might think that the tape, the mixtape itself or the PA tape itself is less important because you could put stuff online and then people could get it theoretically wherever they want. But there are things that I think people who make those arguments about the internet are missing in terms of the internet's impact. And I think the, the most of the research coming out now is showing the internet isn't really changing anything in terms of opening up access to, to um, uh, a wider array of cultural expression or news or, or, or things of that nature. So um, I, we should at least be concerned, if not uh, um, 
you know, uh, whether or not we want to fully believe it's the death knell or that there's hope uh, in the internet or in, in what's going on with the dispersed communities. Right, right. That's interesting. That thing you said about hearing somebody get into the pocket and then <laughs> and then get kicked off, like that's impossible for a go-go band. At some point, no matter how straight they're supposed to be playing it, that's just an instinct. And it's just a rhythm. It, it's the same thing. I mean, well, we all know the history of the drum in this country. The mm -hmm. drum is seen as threatening. And uh, and I remember when Max Roach was asked uh, before he died what he thought of hip hop, you know, as the maybe the most famous jazz drummer, he said um, he said uh, 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 the thing he liked most about rap music was that you could hear the revolution in the drum. And I think that that point uh, from the flip side, if, if we see that as a positive, I think there's, those are, there are those who would obviously see that as a negative and see the, the, the revolutionariness, the, the, <laughs> the revolutionary tendency in the drum to be a problem. And I think that a lot of people do, um, uh, particularly those in power, you know, they hear that drum, that beat, and they feel threatened. So I could definitely understand that. But yeah, I mean, what he was telling us uh, was that Bands are being told if you want jobs in the city proper, within the city limits, you have to not even bring uh, the the conga set. You can't even bring that. You know, try to reform yourself as like a, a neo jazz band or some kind of neo soul type of thing or something like that. Um, but yeah, he said, you know, they like you said. I mean, how can you avoid the pocket? Like, especially you got it, you know. And then again, to me. The pocket is uh, the best place to be, so I don't know, I can't even imagine what that must be like to try not to play it as an artist, and then to be in the audience and not get to hear it would be frustrating and annoying. Um, so uh, what bands or individual artists have contributed in major ways to the popularization of Go-Go? Uh, well, I, you know, obviously, I mean, I, you know, so the first tape I heard, and this was out here in, well, in Howard County, was uh, had Trouble Funk on it. Uh, certainly Rare Essence, uh, EU, uh, Sugar Bear and Juju and them. Go-Go Mickey is, uh, you know, legendary beyond Go-Go uh, um, and beyond uh, DC even. Um, and I have to say the best part I have to, about the internet is that you can now go to Go-Go Mickey's blog and watch video of him practicing and playing and talking about it, which I would, I mean, if that had been around in the 80s, I would have been out of my mind. That would have been one of the best things, you know. Um, uh, Chuck Brown, obviously, you know, he is he has gone far beyond um, probably anybody in in, in popularity and uh, uh, exposing Go Go to the to the world. Uh, I caught something online a little while ago of Wale. Uh, not that I would put him in that category, but I, I do want to say I was impressed to see him performing live in New York City with a go-go band, which I thought was fantastic uh, to see, and I really appreciated that. Um, but, uh, you know, I used to go to the, you know, you know junkyard band, backyard band, um, and then I would go to uh, sort of the way these bands would all sort of reform in themselves into other, you know, arrangements. I mean, Rare Essence has had, you know, what, 70 different formations, and I'm still upset that I missed that reunion that happened this summer. Um, but uh, I used to go a lot to the Maisha and the Hip Huggers, which was really EU with a little bit of Junkyard Band and Maisha, although she wasn't really there when you know all the time either. So it was like you know uh, subtle thoughts, um, and I honestly can't remember which of the major bands had reformed into that group, but I think there were several. Um, Nine One One was was big for me for a while. Uh, so I'm sure I'm missing somebody or some group, but but those would be the names that would first come to me, could come to my mind. And I remember seeing um, James Funk, who I want to say this on tape. I don't know if this is gonna make the final cut, but I think it's it's a travesty that you have a legend like James Funk at WPFW in DC who does not play go go or is not allowed to play go go on the radio. Um, you have, I'm sure he knows as much about the blues as anybody, but it just seems to me a, a waste of a moment where you have this legend literally walking into the studio and not engaging in what he's legendary for. It seems kind of like a waste. It's unfortunate. But, um, uh, but, he, but I saw him in an interview, interview talking about the, the, the uh, Rare Essence reunion this summer, and he was talking about the phases 
and it reminded me that I was coming into to Rare Essence in the in the mid to late eighties in the in the middle of a of a series of phases because he talked about the uh, Capital Center show uh, as a phase, and that was the first tape I got um, that had uh, that that legendary collective. Uh, Lil Benny, rest in peace, uh, was on there, and um, uh, several others again whose names I'm embarrassed to probably be, to be forgetting, but. Um, that was the era that I came into it as a young kid and, and saw, uh, 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 so yeah, Rare Essence and, and um, Little Benny and who else was on that thing? But anyway, it was the Capitol Center show, I think in, was it 1985 or something like that. That tape in particular had made it out even to where I was in Howard County and became uh, sort of what, you know, brought me back or brought me into it, you know. Well, let me ask you this, sure, I sure. was a question related to it down mm -hmm. there. Um, is it? Do you notice the same phenomenon that like Go Go doesn't make sense to people on the PA tapes if they've never been to one? No oh, matter yeah. how much you love it, if Absolutely. you're like, oh, they crank, you're like, I don't get it at Absolutely. all, and you're like, ah, oh, it doesn't. For some reason, it never really quite translates. Well, I mean, I mean, a absolutely, and, and and you know, I've uh, and for those of us who are from the DC area who travel around the world or meet people from around the world who who either don't appreciate Go Go or outright hate it. The first thing you do, you have to say to them, if you haven't seen it live, it, it's just not going to be the same. I mean, and so you're right, the, the, even the PA tape experience, I mean, really, the way I always understood it was that the PA tape was almost meant to be for, like, those who were there to have, like, a, 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 um, a um, piece of memorabilia to take with them uh, as much as it was to promote it to somebody who wasn't familiar or, or you know, in the way radio would be for music to, to introduce you to something new that you would then fall in love with. I think the PA tape was like, no, this is like, you know, and to this day you could go, um, uh, actually not too long ago I got, there was, um, I think a late seventies piece that had, uh, that, um, uh, uh, Slick Rick was on and Dougie Fresh was on. Like they had come down and did a show with Rare Essence. I think it's the late seventies, early eighties even, um, that, uh, uh, that I'm sure if I had been there live, it would have been, you know. But no, I agree with you. It's, 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 it's. You got to see it live. You got to, you, you, you have to have experienced it live to fully appreciate what you're hearing on the tape. And um, uh, yeah, the tape is really just to be like, you know, remember how great this night was. Um, uh, you know. Uh, does that answer your question? Does yeah, no, it does. Okay. I was, it seems like everyone feels gets the same phenomenon. Like you can't. No matter how many CDs you take with you, you can't export export it to some another city and play it for them. And they'd be like, "Oh yeah." Yeah, no, they gotta be there. They gotta go. They gotta feel the. And because again, I think a lot of it is is the the beat is is phenomenal. The pocket is phenomenal. The way they rework popular songs, I think, is phenomenal. But there is something that we were saying earlier in that familial thing that that the vibe that is generated from this being really like a close knit type of thing. And I think that there is something to it about, you know, this is just for us. Like this is just our thing. We don't even care if the world doesn't appreciate it. That makes the moment itself. Mm -hmm. And that's yeah. the biggest, that's yeah. probably the biggest difference between the um, hip hop mixtape and the, and the PA tape. Yeah. Besides all the other obvious Good differences, point. but like DJ Clue ended up being popular all over the East Coast because no matter where he went, you didn't have to have been there when he exactly. DJed it together. To, but it's also it also talks about the the transformation in in the in the, the rap music mixtape, which itself initially was sort of a PA tape, as DJs were just recording their live performances at parties and house parties or rooftop parties or whatever. Um, and then later on, and a lot of this, the, the the real experts on mixtape history have pointed specifically to Clue as being the main one to really. They try to put a, a you know as positive a spin on it as possible, but it was really the main one to sort of um, you know corporatize, mass produce, uh, not really mix, not really DJ, just get exclusive tracks and then shout on them um, as a brand you know uh, as a branding mechanism, which is brilliant, but it kind of takes away from what the mixtape was or could be or I think should be, which it should you know should be about DJ skills or if not DJ skills about the you know in, in the the um, ingenuity and in blending or mixing or putting things together or messages or doing whatever you're doing but not just look I got the latest mp3 because I st stood outside of Sony Studios or you know whatever and got somebody to drop something to me uh, to be street promotion before their album comes out and then I just put clue 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 on it and 
you know, I mean, it kind of takes away from it. it's unfortunate, but but yeah, and I think that that's uh, an important and key difference that you that you uh, highlight there. Yeah, no doubt, absolutely. What role did the PA tape play in the spread of hip uh, of go go, and how is it similar and different than the role of the mixtape in hip hop? Because um, we touched on that a little bit. Yeah, we did. The only thing I would want to add to that real quick is that I do think it's important to note that, uh, and I'm not the first one to say this, but that the mixtape was rap music's original mass medium, and I think that the PA tape uh, is the same, that it was the original mass medium of Go-Go, and I think it's important to, to remember that in terms of, um, again, from my own personal formulation, that, that this is what colonized people have to do. There's not going to be ready-made access to the mainstream media outlets uh, for whatever is being culturally produced until they're ready to co-opt it and destroy it uh, or misuse it. Um, against the very population that's producing it. Um, so I, I don't think it could be uh, 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 underestimated the role that they played initially, and I would argue still play. I mean, I think that if you look at the mixtape scene, even as it appears digitized in MP3 formats, is, is uh, tremendously important. I mean, there is uh, a, 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 a wide array, a variety of mixtapes still being produced that go beyond the more popular corporatized forms that we talked about in terms of DJ Clue, where DJs and artists are able to be, to really break formula, break uh, the norm in terms of what they do, in, uh, both in terms of content and style, um, length of songs, all kinds of stuff. Um, a lot of people use mixtapes because you can avoid you know, copyright issues, sampling issues, which I think is great. And um, uh, so I, I think that it's something that again in my own personal work is very important because I think that you, you know even holding on to the tradition of, of underground alternative communication networks is important particularly for people in oppressed communities so I would like to think that these traditions would be um, maintained and raised up in terms of their uh, overall importance uh, and especially now I mean I think the question you asked earlier about what role the PA tape might play as communities are just forcibly dispersed uh, something that could be considered as a mechanism of, of holding the communities together as best you can, uh, finding new distribution networks, um, and and you know maybe using it to to, to counter what McNeils was saying about the absence of venues, the absence of tapes, the absence of bands leading to a death of the culture. You could have maybe uh, a new mixtape, PA tape network that might help keep it alive, may help it survive. Um, you know, that's at least the hope I would have. So how has the absence of traditional distribution channels for go-go music impacted the commercial viability of the music? The, I think the one beautiful thing about go-go that extends from what we were saying earlier about the familial uh, community ties is that I don't know that go-go has ever really uh, relied on any commercial value. I don't know that go-go bands have really looked for the commercial uh, uh, value to be there. I don't think that they do it for money. I don't think it's done as necessarily as a means to escape poverty and, and so on and so forth. Uh, I think it's more or less done as a community friendly family thing, which is why I think so few bands are really interested in, in creating so-called original music. I think that, they, uh, that there's, that's why I think there's in part uh, uh, a tendency to just remake popular songs and have a party because I think that's ultimately uh, the beauty of it and, uh, and, I, and I actually like that. I would love of course for people to be able to get paid and make money and live well and I would love to see more, particularly some of these legends, just be able to be professional, uh, full-time professional Coco performers and music makers but I don't think that's ever been the goal and I think that's one of the beautiful things about it um, that makes it so powerful actually is that it doesn't rely on the record industry, it doesn't rely on anything other than uh, it's almost like the, the origins of, of rap music, the, the, the performers like yourself even, who I think, while there is a, obviously a desire to, to make money, the people are doing it because they love it. People are doing it because they want to do it. They're doing it, you know, um, and I think this helps explode the myth that people only produce art if they think they're going to get paid. I think that's absolutely mythology, and I think Go-Go is part of the proof of that. They do it because they love it. We go because we love it. And um, as venues continue to get shut down, it does seem, and I hope, that other venues will open themselves up to it 
because there's obviously an audience for it and uh, it, I think it's great. Um, so I, I, that PA tapes are very important because they are the means by which most go-go shows have been documented over the years. When uh, Charles Stevenson and I were writing The Beat and the first edition that came out in 2001, we were going to include a discography of important go-go recordings. In fact, what I thought about doing was a comprehensive go-go discography. And when I realized how many PA tapes were out there in 2001 and how difficult it would be to document the exact dates in which they were done, that was part of the issue because those are usually pretty well documented on the tapes themselves, but the personnel and trying to track down every single go-go PA tape ten years ago, I just threw up my hands. And so what we did was to include a um, list of the important selections that if you lived somewhere outside the area, uh, you could get through a variety of means. PA tapes are important because what they do is to document a live musical performance. And there are thousands of them. They're different than mixed tapes from that you find in hip hop, but you do also find mixtapes in GoGo. I don't know if you've ever seen any of the commercially made mixtapes in GoGo, but they they are around. Um, they tend to be homegrown productions, which is one way in which they're similar to uh, hip hop mixtapes. Uh, they tend to be live performances, but sometimes you also find uh, mixtapes of GoGo from commercial sources as well. People are able to do that largely because most of the go-go that's ever been recorded has either been on a PA tape or it's been on a uh, small local commercial uh, label, which usually doesn't have the wherewithal or clout to track down any songs that might be pirated onto some other kind of edition. So, the how is it different than the hip-hop mixtape? You know, when I think about that, I don't. I don't deal with, with hip-hop mixtapes that much. Okay. Um, it's a good question, but I don't know enough. I, I mean, I'm familiar with mixtapes in general, but what would you say is the difference between a go-go and a hip-hop mixtape? Well, oh, the, 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 from the discussion a couple hours ago, we came up with the idea that the biggest difference is um, that the go-go PA tape is more memorabilia than the mixtape is and the mixtape is more dissemination and promotion than what people like cause I, it's hard I've taken PA tapes out of the out of the state out of the area and played it for people and they always have to have the same conversation well I know you don't really feel it but you gotta be there you gotta be there if okay. you're there this would sound great to you you know what I'm saying and mm -hmm. hip-hop mixtapes don't have the same effect it's like if you hear it you like it or not because it's clean and it's produced but you kind of got to feel the energy of GoGo for the PA tape to really. That, that, is, that is one of the issues related to GoGo in general, but it seems to me that if you're taking a PA tape directly off the board and it's a, and it's a good, clean digital feed, it's going to sound pretty good. So I, I think really the issue there is not so much the quality of the sound. I think so many people outside D.C. are just ignorant of GoGo. They just don't know anything about it. Mm -hmm. um, so it seems to me it's as it's much as when you're dealing with either mixtapes for GoGo -Go or disseminating PA tapes for GoGo, -Go, the real issue is not so much that people don't like it, they're just so unfamiliar with it. And then the other thing is though, it is very much about the neighborhood and the time and the place that it happened. It, it, it is about that, but you know, I was, we were talking about New Orleans, we're talking about New Orleans now in the Black American Music class, mm -hmm. and we're talking about particular neighborhoods and we're talking about uh, Mardi Gras Indians and how important that is in a particular neighborhood or a particular family or a particular ward in New Orleans. Now, I'm not sure that that um, when you hear a and there are of course mixtapes and and all kinds of documentary uh, video and oral material related to Mardi Gras Indians. I'm not sure it's really that different in that regard from Gogo. -Go. Uh, they're very, you're right, they're very community oriented, they're very neighborhood oriented, they're very family oriented in some ways. Um, but it seems to me that they've got, there are some parallels, especially early on with hip hop. If we're talking about hip hop, either West Coast or New York City in the 1970s or 1980s, there's a lot of very local references there. And it seems to me that I would, yeah, I would agree with you. Hip-hop, to a large extent, 
is not as localized, but as an artist yourself here in Washington, D.C., do you try to localize any of the things that you do? And that do your things end up on mixtapes? Um, mine is less local than like the raw, real go go. Like, I have, when I'm performing, when I'm really rolling, I have like an eight piece band. And people want to call it a go go band, and I go out of the way to say it's not. Not because we don't sound like go go, because I feel like go go is a culture. It is playing four nights a week. It is, um, a friend of mine explained it to me, because I always have beef with um, go go bands not being songwriters. And, they were, that, and that's a legitimate concern for yeah. most of them, yes. And, and they were saying the reason is because the guys on the microphone aren't necessarily artists. They're usually, not all the time, but sometimes they aren't artists, they're just the most popular dude in the neighborhood. And, or for various different reasons, but the person who's literally hosting the party. And so they know everyone, people came to see them because they're so popular. Yes. And so it's not the same as somebody who's been, you know, in a basement writing lyrics all day. And, you know. And, you know, when you talk about that, the first the first person I think of as someone is a more contemporary figure in Go Go who does, who's a good lead talker, mm -hmm. uh, is probably Big G. I mean, Anwan Glover is, is an mm -hmm. impressive, very charismatic fellow. Mm -hmm. And I think people who come to see Backyard come to see him, but they also come to hear what he has to say. And in some ways, there's that's one of the relationships between Hip hop and go go, and to hear him mention their neighborhood. Sure, yeah, sure. And you're right. One of the other differences, the go go doesn't often take on a lot of the kinds of topics that you hear in hip hop, especially consciousness hip hop, uh, the Black Arts Movement, uh, the legacy of slavery, um, relationship with police. I mean, there's all kinds of things. Um, that Go Go tends to shy away from, and that's certainly one of the differences that you're going to find lyrically between Go Go and hip hop. Um, but you're, I think you're also right in the, the PA tapes that you find floating in the Go Go community tend to be somewhat nostalgic. They tend to be um, representative of what you would have heard at that show, and you might want to get that tape because what what was particularly happening at that show at that time. But what's, I think, interesting, I can't think of another, you know, in looking at black American music writ large and thinking about, you know, the whole concept of having mixtapes, um, I think about the importance that mixtapes have had in Washington, D.C., because if you look at the PA Palace's list of all the um, PA tapes they have, there's thousands of them. And since you said you were hung up on bebop, just imagine Every little alternative take that Charlie Parker might appear on, if it's a live recording from Storyville in Boston from 1948, and they suddenly found a reel of tape in which he plays Donna Lee that's mm -hmm. never been issued before, collectors are going to go nuts. And it seems to me that at some point people, I, I, I can't think of another form of contemporary black American music in some ways that's been as well documented in live performances as go-go. You know, you think about regional American music, black American music, and I have, once again will go back to the body bar engines since we were talking about them in, in class today. But if you think about crunk in Houston, I don't think that's certainly not documented for as long because it hasn't been around as long as go-go. Um, there's, there's, the, the importance of PA tapes, I think, will will come, will become more apparent as time goes on. But there clearly is a big difference between go go and hip hop. Oh, okay. Well, how do you feel that the venues in DC have affected the spread of these, you know, go go music, the culture? There's been a long, uneasy relationship between venues in Washington D.C. and uh, go go music. You know, even if you go back to the 1980s with Frank Smith trying to pass laws with the city council, restricting go-go, uh, the relationship in PG County in the last year or two uh, between violence and go-go. And of course, I think quite rightly, the uh, counter argument to that is you almost never actually find violence in the clubs themselves. It's usually some kind of neighborhood beef that's out on the streets, outside of the uh, uh, the venue itself where the violence occurs. Uh, I can think of only a handful of incidents over the last 15 to 20 years that I've been following GoGo -Go fairly closely where you've actually had problems in the venue itself. 
any kind of serious problems. And I think that really underscores the um, kind of uneasy relationship as DC has become, uh, has had home rule, and as DC becomes decreasing, increasingly less black American. I think in 2010 you'll find that the black population in Washington, D.C. is probably somewhere between 55 and 60 percent, way down from, from the Chocolate City days in the mid-1970s. I think Professor Ball told me a minute ago it's 52 percent. Yeah, I, 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 I knew that in the last census it was just under, 50, just under 60 percent in 2000. So it's going to, I knew, I know it's heading down, so if it's 52 percent or somewhere in that vicinity, it's just going to continue as gentrification uh, continues as well. And of course, it's going to be harder for lower class folks, whether you're Hispanic or black, to live in Washington, D.C., uh, especially downtown or anywhere near downtown because you can't afford it. Um, I was just over in Anacostia at the Anacostia Museum of Smithsonian about two weeks ago, and it reminded me how lovely Anacostia is. It's probably the prettiest part of Washington, D.C. Um, still relatively affordable because it's far enough away from downtown Washington, D.C. Uh, white folks generally don't like to ride the bus to a place like Anacostia, which is the easiest way to get there. I mean, you can get there in the Green Line, of course. Mm -hmm. um, so gentrification hasn't really hit Anacostia because it's physically removed far enough. That I, and that will eventually change, I think. And of course, you have neighborhoods like Trinidad that are still kind of dicey. But right on Capitol Hill, for all well, intents and Right on the edge of Capitol Hill. Yeah. So they're not far from downtown. And even if you go into Washington, D.C. and New York Avenue after it crosses Florida, just think about that. How that is slowly changing, you know, two miles from downtown uh, in a major city. I can't think of another place that would be that, another city in, in the country, except for probably now Detroit, because that's been so decimated. So uh, we could be, you know, a mile or two miles directly from K Street, it's smack downtown that hasn't been that well developed. So as that continues, I think there's going to be an increasing pressure on folks to find other places to live. In you know, you made me think of something very interesting, and that's because when I moved to PG County, I moved to, um, to Lake Arbor, Mitchellville. Oh yeah, I know where Lake Arbor is. Okay. Went to Largo High School, Kettering yeah. Middle School. Almost everyone there, almost everyone there was the first generation Mission. out of DC. DC and go go music was more important to us, I think, than anybody else because mm -hmm. we didn't like not being Washingtonians mm -hmm. and because it's something and there's that tie to Washington. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I do a lot of college and high school volleyball officiating, and I did a uh, regional playoff match at High Point four years ago, and it was High Point against maybe it was Forestville. And but which, whichever was the visiting team, mm -hmm. that visiting team's pep band was a go-go band. And of course, I didn't think anything of it. I mentioned to my students, and I, and I happened to have a student in the Black American History class that year, from Prince George's County, and she had gone to. It might have been Largo, it might have been Oxon Hill, but it was mm -hmm. that section of the county. Mm -hmm. And she said, "Well, yeah, of course." <laughs> Yo, my, my graduation and my graduation at the Cap Center. They played pomp and circumstance in the pocket, <laughs> <laughs> and we didn't think anything of it. We, yeah. we, we were we did think of it. We were like, oh, that's exactly that's how you supposed to do it. That's the way mm -hmm. the pomp and circumstance mm -hmm. should be played. Yeah, it, it rocked. So yeah, we 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 represented. I think we represented it as hard, if not harder, than DC kids, just because we wanted to. We didn't but, like but being of course, suburbanites. But as you pointed out, that Eastern Avenue line between Prince George's County and you know Ward. Ward 8 in Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. is just the street. Right. It's I mean, not It's not a real thing. It's not a, it's, it's, yeah. a, it's, a, it's a political economic concept that when you look at it culturally and socially, pretty much doesn't exist. So why hasn't it, well, maybe this is the thing, because this is it's more than a street, because one of the questions on here is, why hasn't it moved to Virginia? Why isn't, why, because I, I know it happens in Virginia sometimes, but I know it's rare, because when a go-go happens in Virginia, I know about it, because it's like, <gasps> You know, they have a go -go in music. yeah, yeah. Well, I think there's a couple reasons why. If if the music and the culture is following the migratory patterns, and you're looking at northern Charles County, Charles County in general, particularly North, northern Charles County, from um, oh, let's see, Brandywine up or Waldorf up, and you're looking at Prince George's County, um, you're looking at a 
a place that's now probably 75% black American, a very wealthy county, the wealthiest predominantly black county in the entire United States. It's, it's basically Washington, D.C. in the suburbs. That didn't happen in Northern Virginia. Um, when folks left Washington, D.C., when black folk left Washington, D.C. in the 60s and 70s, they left in order to come to Prince George's County. Now, that, I can turn that question around as, why didn't more black Americans migrate to Fairfax or Alexandria? I mean, they did. You will find in Old Town Alexandria, there are families that have been there for centuries, black American families. So when folks left Southeast DC, I think part of it is literally, there wasn't a river to cross. I think also, in addition <laughs> to that, I mean, I, I'm serious, mm -hmm. I think that's part of it. I think also the perception of Virginia is it's more conservative, less friendly to black folks. They tell and, you to beware of the cops in Virginia. Yeah, I mean, we, we, we didn't even look at a place in Virginia because the politics are too conservative. <laughs> and, and quite frankly, you gotta cross the damn river. Um, and we lived here long enough, both of my spouse and I were downtown on 9-11, right, and we bought this house in November of 2001. We didn't move here for a couple years after that for a whole host of reasons, but we bought it in November 2001. We never looked at a house in Virginia at all. Um, and since we were downtown, we saw all the people with, with Virginia plates heading north up Georgia Avenue to go back around the Beltway because you couldn't go across any of the bridges. So I think it's a psychological barrier. You just mentioned you've got to watch out for the cops in Virginia. I think there are a whole host of reasons why people, black folks, when they left Washington, D.C., went to Prince George's County. That's one of the reasons why you have go-go's in Virginia, but the population base is just so different. You just don't have the support. Mm -hmm. Um, let's see what we... Okay, are there significant go-go DJs that have contributed to the popularization of music? There has been, oh, of course, it's interesting, when you use the word DJ, I think of DJs and radio. Mm. Ah, an interesting... Just, that, just the voice. I behind. think about the voice, right. and when, when, when I mention DJs to my students at GW, almost all of whom are conventional college age, they don't think radio DJ, they think DJ in front of a live audience, right. spinning selections of one kind or another, or mm -hmm. mixing or whatever. If they're, you know, if they're old school enough, they might be doing some scratching, who knows? Mm -hmm. So when you say, when you say DJ, I, my immediate response was the uneasy relationship between go-go -go and radio airplay and DJs. Because if you, you know, it's interesting that with the deregulation in, in 1996 of the Telecommunications Act that Bill Clinton signed and probably shouldn't, um, I, don't know how many I don't know how many stations Clear Channel owns now, but it's probably 17 or 1800 around the country, and I think they own eight in Washington, D.C., but it's some large number. Um, despite that, um, on Sunday night, of course, at 9 o'clock on KYS, mm -hmm. I make my students listen to GoGo, uh, -Go, because you can hear an hour of it, and, and also in the evenings on PGC, um, you can hear GoGo -Go at different times. It, what I think is significant is that, number one, you can actually hear GoGo -Go on commercial radio in Washington, D.C. It's also significant, I think, in some ways that the main alternative black music voice, the messenger here in Washington, D.C., doesn't have anything to do with go-go. I've always thought that that was very odd. You think that a homegrown music like go-go that you don't really hear in the, in the radio all that often uh, would gain at least a, a, a bit of a foothold on uh, WPFW, but it absolutely hasn't. They even play Zadiko. They'll play Zydeco uh -huh. yeah. and, and you know Caribbean music, which is fine. Mm -hmm. Lots of jazz, all of that is good, but they they absolutely ignore go go, and I don't understand that. So to answer in one way, uh, in terms of radio, uh, when you mention DJs, DJ Big John on Sunday nights, and then when when Big G actually shows up, which he does occasionally, I think probably because so many. I think a lot of people listen. It's probably the most down-home radio show you will hear in a major metropolitan area, except for the Bama show on 
WPFW. <laughs> I'm talking commercial radio. Right. You tell me when they they, they go out of there, they play local stuff. They play local stuff. Yeah. And it's and a not necessarily go over like, yeah. And but but on, for a major commercial, I mean, KYS and PGC are almost always rated in the top, always rated in the top three to five Arbitron ratings for commercial radio stations in Washington D.C. So they get heard a lot by old people like me. <laughs> um, you know, almost none of my students ever listen to commercial radio. They'll listen to podcasts sometimes of radio, and they'll also listen online, but actually listen to a real radio station. It's the minority. Mm. Um, but when I asked that question of kids in Washington, D.C., because I did a talk at McKinley and also at Cesar Chavez within the last six months or so, they all said that they listened to PGC and KYS and they listened to GoGo on those stations. So, you know, they didn't necessarily single out a DJ in particular, but they did single out radio as one way they consumed GoGo. And it makes me wonder if P.D. Green had been around longer he might have been an interesting, an interesting voice in general, but if somehow Gogo might have been more of a backdrop for him, if he had you know been on the planet longer than he was. What what was his relationship with the music? I never I never thought to ask that. Um, you know I I don't know the answer to that. Um, I have seen and heard clips of him interviewing people from the TV show and the radio, but I don't get a clear sense that he related to Gogo, but it could well have been there. And I simply don't know about it because I was not in Washington, D.C. at that time. Mm -hmm. But it seems to me that Gogo would be something that he would really embrace. That, especially when his, the height of his popularity is when it started being oh, like, this is D.C. thing. Oh, yeah, yeah, definitely the D.C. thing. Yeah. Um, when it comes to the other use of the term DJ, um, I, th I always think of Gogo as being such a live medium in clubs that... Any time a go-go band plays, the DJ would be secondary to me. Now, I may be wrong about that. Int it, I think it would be very interesting to ask this question of a younger black American who consumes go-go in a very different way than I do, who goes to live performances more often, mm -hmm. and then contrast that with a middle-aged black American who also consumes go-go differently and perceives it differently than I do. I think you'd get very different answers about the importance of a DJ. From the students that I work with, the uh, the actual tape has been replaced by YouTube. Oh, that's, and I'll tell you, I remember when YouTube started, mm -hmm. within about three months I was starting to use it in my classes. Mm -hmm. I was using YouTube today in my classes mm -hmm. to show stuff. Mm -hmm. And you're right, the mix, I think the... And not even the visuals, just the audio with just the name of the band. The and, yeah. yes. I, I don't think that, that certainly has not entirely supplanted the PA tape, mm -hmm. um, but it certainly has changed the landscape because YouTube, YouTube has in many ways. Um, a lot of uh, older performances of, of race films from the 1930s and 40s that I have older clips of, I can now find cleaner copies on YouTube. So if I want to mm -hmm. show the Nicholas mm -hmm. Brothers performing in Stormy Weather, that dance sequence they do with Cat Calloway that's just fabulous. Mm. Um, and also them performing with Louis Jordan in 1952 on a Louis Jordan short. Much better versions of that on YouTube than are available commercially at this point. So it will be interesting to see what YouTube does too. But you know, that's the other thing that YouTube does for GoGo. -Go. That means that you know, before you could download stuff and you could hear it on GoGo -Go Radio, but with YouTube, that means it's somebody in Auckland, New Zealand, or somebody in San Francisco, or somebody in Reykjavik, Iceland, could now easily access GoGo -Go material in a way that they couldn't before. What has been, what has been the, um, the main mode of, of distribution for GoGo, -Go, specifically GoGo -Go PA tapes? But Well, it, it's interesting. Let me, let me expand on that in just in terms of disseminating GoGo -Go music in general. You've got a couple different levels of, of uh, documenting GoGo -Go and disseminating it with commercial record companies. You got the big boys, you got Virgin that recorded um, Trouble Funk and made probably the worst Trouble Funk album. Uh, I think it's called Trouble Coming, I think, from about 1986 or 87. It's just generic funk. They really took the DC out of it. It's mm. not very good. Like specifically the percussion or? Um, uh, it's, just, it's just so lackluster. It's hard to explain. I mean, the band was there using their usual instruments, but there's just something about it that, that 
I, I haven't listened to it in quite a while because it's, it, when I heard it, I was just so disappointed. <laughs> I thought, well, Trouble Funk can make it big, they're on Virgin. And then I heard it and said, no wonder, it's just, there's just, it's flaccid, there's just not much to it. Mm. Um, and then, of course, Def Jam uh, had Junkyard for a while. Rick Rubin, right? You got it. Yeah. Sardines. Yeah. I learned that three years ago. That blew my mind. Yep. Rick Rubin is a music finding genius. I didn't realize he, he, is. he discovered uh, um, the Ghetto Boys in hip hop, mm -hmm. which basically makes him the godfather of Southern rap, which is insane. Well, if if you look at Chillin, there is a specific, you know, mm -hmm. besides showing uh, Ben's Chili Bowl, mm -hmm. which we had lunch at three weeks ago. I brought my students down That's to lunch up. at Ben's Chili Bowl. <laughs> A lot of them had been there, but right, a lot right. of times you kind of have to, course, right? Right. The majority of people haven't been. This was one of the classes where most people had been. I said, mm -hmm. oh, we'll go down there. Right. It's a class from eleven ten to twelve thirty, anyway. So right, right. Time. <laughs> but there's a scene right after that where in the in the video where it shows them outside of Ben's Chili Bowl, but then it cuts directly to a can of sardines next to. Mm. And I just okay. roared and laughed when I first saw okay. it. I don't think I paid attention one. to that. It, it goes by pretty fast. Okay. But you know, it's you one of those things, it. if you catch it, you, you get it. Right, right, right. But all the students said, well, what does that mean? I had to go, oh, man, I have to explain this to you, don't I? <laughs> <laughs> um, so you got the big boys who basically have not done, I think probably Def Jam did better with, um, uh, with Junkyard than yeah. almost anybody else did. Okay. And they had good distribution, but both Virgin and Def Jam was looking for go, go, to go, national and international. It didn't happen. Mm -hmm. So they quickly dropped groups like that. Then you have the local labels, and the problem with the local labels has been distribution. I mean, Tom Goldfogel, who was Chuck's manager, um, was working with the distribution company that he and Becky started to basically distribute um, to one stops around here and to also make sure that GoGo -Go got disseminated around here. Uh, they, uh, the distribution company is still in business, but with the, you know, the downturn and all the sales for CDs anyway, it's been a tough way to go. And of course, now the, on the upside of that is any band that wants to could make a pretty professionally sounding and appearing compact disc. Mm -hmm. Distribution is the problem. Mm -hmm. How to get those suckers out, out of, you know, you can sell them at shows. And the same thing, the same distribution essential, issue essentially occurs for PA tapes. Mm -hmm. You will find that most locally produced go-go, um, whether it's a PA tape, or whether it's, you know, Trouble Funk has done or EU has done their own albums, is you can sell them pretty steadily here locally, but once you get outside of the comfort zone for GoGo, -Go, um, you will always get steady sales of a couple hundred to fans all across the country, but after that, it just totally falls it, off. It, it doesn't pass. I, th I think people will appreciate PA tapes more as we go down the line in years to come than they do now. Because in taking a broad kind of approach to looking at documenting American music in general, because if people ask me what do you do, I say I'm a, basically I'm interested in American vernacular music and from Reconstruction to the present, and looking at how people have documented either in terms of interviewing or sound recordings, I don't think there's been a particular genre that's so tied to a particular place that has been documented as well on PA tapes as GoGo -Go has been here in Washington, D.C. And I, and I think probably long after Charles and I are dead, somebody's going to say, you know, Pat Lornell and the Stevens, they were smart. They, they were able to talk to and interview almost all the important GoGo -Go figures because they did the book early enough on when virtually everybody was still alive. And 50 years from now, they're going to say, oh, man, they did that at the right time. Mm -hmm. Instead of trying to go back, it's like, looking, re, trying to figure out in the 1950s to go back to what was going on in New Orleans when jazz was emerging at the turn of the 20th century, You're going back 50 years. Um, the same thing to a degree is already true if you want to go back and look at hip-hop emerging in whenever you think it emerged, late 60s, mid 70s, late there's, 70s. There's, there's a big debate when, you know, exactly when exactly you start calling that hip-hop. Exactly when that might have occurred, but you know, it's going to be harder and harder as you go along to do that kind of stuff. Shoot, I, I, I've come to the realization from the music I've been listening to is that not only is James Brown the most popularly sampled in hip-hop, he's the first MC 
if you listen to him. Oh, if you listen to Live at the Apollo, yeah, for example. Yeah. Oh yeah. He's definitely he's definitely more more hip hop <laughs> than anything else before it was called that. Well, yeah. yeah. And, and if you also think about in terms of hip hop, how do you figure the last poets into right. the development? Of how do you how do you figure Rudy Raymore into, into hip hop? Well, in fact, I. I <laughs> Rudy Raymore visited our class, so to speak, about two really? weeks ago. I wanted to show uh, the show the movie. So one of the movies. I showed part of Dolomite. That's what's up. That's what's up. <laughs> one of my one of my uh, rap alter egos is is a variation on the name Dolomite. Dolomite. Yeah. <laughs> well, we were talking about the dozens and some other stuff and how you, know, you can't really. A lot of what I talk about is you can't really understand contemporary black expressive culture and music without understanding all the other things we're talking about. And today we showed, after we showed a, um, but a part of a 10 minute documentary on, on, on uh, Mardi Gras Indians that said, now you can talk about how these Mardi Gras Indians are so similar to Go-Go and Go-Go artists and how all of them have all of these elements that we've been talking about, these 12 essential elements of African American expressive culture and performance every single one of them is in there and they will also apply to most hip-hop artists mm -hmm. they'll also apply if you go to the united house of prayer for all people mm -hmm. they'll apply to if you go to see parliament funkadelic they'll they'll apply largely if you go to see um CeeLo, if he's going to play at constitution mm -hmm. hall i mean all of these things that you know you didn't believe me at the beginning when i said you could apply to all this stuff mm -hmm. well now applying all this stuff to all these different things and you're seeing that you know, these elements are, are so important, and also how far back some of them go, how importantly they're rooted in culture. <laughs> and that's one of the other things I say about Go-Go is it's too black mm -hmm. in terms of performance mm -hmm. practices. It's not only local, but all the percussion, the non-stop performances, it's not, neat, it's not neatly tied up and packaged. You know, the, uh, one of the coolest shows I've ever seen of Go-Go is, I want to say it's Junkyard performing in Ontario at a jazz festival. <laughs> <laughs> and I want to say they was doing like they were doing rough it off, yeah. and they had a whole bunch of forty-five-year-old <laughs> white people in Ontario like that. It was it was really really cool. <laughs>